Okay, well, I, I have the fantastic opportunity here to sit down with uh, Chris Creed. It's not often you get to sit down with someone who has uh, literally the largest checkbook investing in, in uh, first-of-a-kind climate technologies on the planet. Uh, no pressure there. Also, just, a, just as background, you do have quite an illustrious history, uh, going all the way back to, to Goldman Sachs, before that, Brown University. Um, and I think you co-led the, the mortgage-backed securities team uh, at Goldman. And so maybe a first question, really, is joining DOE and the Loan Programs Office, your way of apologizing for the 2008 financial <laughs> disaster. You know, it's a funny story because, uh, you know, when I first met Jigger, he and I were chatting, and he's like, I really want a mortgage-backed securities person to come help save the polar bears. And I was like, that just can't be true. But it is. So much of emissions come from buildings. And if you don't understand how buildings, residential and commercial, are financed, you're messing it up. And so it actually is, it ended up being a, a great foray into energy and how to attack the climate crisis. And so I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And we're very, very glad to have you. And it's always good to, to turn people away from the dark side. Uh, I was at, at Renewable Energy RE Plus last week in, in Vegas, and uh, the number of people who uh, you'd say, oh, so how long have you been in renewables? And they'd be like, well, I've been in energy for a while. It's all those oil and gas people turning to renewables these days. Okay, well, let's start out. I'm sure that there's not many people here in the room who don't know, but just give us the 30 seconds. DOE Loan Program Office, what is it? Yeah, no, I mean, it's an amazing uh, thing in our government that we should all be proud of. It's a private credit fund in the Department of Energy. With the IRA, we have about 350 to $400 billion to invest in debt in American energy infrastructure. And we basically manage four, five programs. One is the Title 17 Clean Energy Program. These are uh, loans to clean energy projects in the United States, either on a innovative project that doesn't require any uh, feature, partnership with the state energy financing institutions. So these are partnerships with states uh, to help uh, address particular uh, uh, energy needs in, in, in their state, or the large energy infrastructure reinvestment program that was passed as part of the IRA, which uh, will help you know reinvest, rejuvenate, replace energy infrastructure that is aged. You know, and the classic example is coal mine or a coal plant in let's pick a random state. This, let's say West Virginia, and they want to replace that energy generation asset with something else. Uh, you have that program, the Advanced Transportation Manufacturing Program, which in the uh, first iteration of LPO was an early investor in Tesla. In this gen uh, iteration of LPO has helped onshore, reshore, and friendshore a lot of our battery chemistries. The first ever active anode assembly facility here in the United States. Every other battery that you've ever bought had their active anode material assembled elsewhere, probably China. And we've been working on large scale projects with Ford and GM, both of those are public, and continue to see how can we you know, spur manufacturing projects in the automotive sector here in the United States. We have a burgeoning tribal program to partner with Native American tribes to help uh, with their energy independence and their energy uh, burden needs. And then uh, the final program is the uh, carbon dioxide infrastructure program to help you know figure out if we're gonna if we're gonna deal with all of this you know CO2, it's got to go somewhere that probably means you know refitting or replacing uh, pipes and that's super expensive. So those programs are the are the ones that we manage and we are seeing a lot of interest across all of those programs. So. These numbers are about, wrong, are about right, but absolutely wrong. We have something like 150 applications for about 150 billion in funding needs, and we're getting about one or two applications, new applications a week. We've put about 30 deals into active due diligence. We've made commitments on 12 or 13 deals. So it's been busy. Yeah, to say the least. And, and I think uh, you have been shoveling money out there about as quickly as you can whilst keeping all of the, the standards up. You know, it's, it's actually really one of the things that I think is misunderstood about the Loan Programs Office is, you know, when you talk about the Loan Programs Office, if you talk about us at all, one or two deals come to mind. Maybe you'll talk about Tesla. And if you don't talk about Tesla, you will almost certainly talk about Solyndra. Definitely Solyndra. And the myth is that the Loan Programs Office made a bunch of loans and that those loans were bad. The reality is, is that we underwrote those loans in 2008 to 2011 timeframe, the bulk of the portfolio. 
The average rating, I'll use the S&P ratings for everybody here, the average rating at origination was double B minus. So rough numbers, 10 to 15% default rate, depending on the tenor. Our default rate was eight and our loss rate was three and a half. So either we're the best investors and underwriters on the planet, and I do think that there's a story there. We have access to the national labs. We have 10,000 engineers and scientists at the Department of Energy that we can call. Our own engineering team, I'll put up against anyone's. You know, we have 50 PhD level scientists that are experts across the energy field. I think they're great. I think that explains some of it. I think that also we're a government agency and we're conservative. And so as we're going forward, we're having to push our own best, our own like conservatism, because if we don't do our job, you guys here in this room can't do yours. Our program only works if we have American entrepreneurs who want to grow using debt capital. And that's risky, and we get it. Like, we're debt lenders. We know what we're doing. We know we have encumbrance over your IP, your buildings. But we want to help give you guys non-dilutive leverage. We want you guys to succeed. And that's the cool part. And there's maybe no better example than Tesla. And there are going to be some, hopefully not too many, where they don't make it. But that's the idea, is that with our due diligence and our effort, working with the American entrepreneurs, that we can design a project in the billions of dollars that can help catalyze the next generation of manufacturing, the next generation of industrial uh, might here in the United States focused on clean energy. And so, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, and also just the, the total amount of money we're talking about here, this, this really moves the needle. But I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too far. You did start talking about politics. You mentioned the S word, Solyndra, right? I think the Solyndra failure was used to paint in broad strokes a bad picture of this program during the Obama era. I think there's an elephant in the room, which is that, <laughs> where is it? Which is that we're coming up on a presidential election next year, right? Um, how important do you think it is that this time around, the DOE's loan program office is also so focused on things like American jobs and national security and energy independence and all of these things, as opposed to potentially, you know, uh, just being clean and green. Yeah, I mean, I think we're actually relatively apolitical. I'm not naive enough to suggest that people will not use the office, but generally speaking, Apple pie, baseball, moms, like no one's really against us, right? We make cheap debt available to American entrepreneurs to create high quality American jobs and make people money. Like that's not an overly objectionable program. And when people come in and see the level of diligence that we put in, there was a comment in one of the podcasts from, from somebody and the, the, the comment was, you know, it's so hard to get a loan out of the out of the loan programs office. Well, you know, we gave Ford close to $10 billion. It should take some time and effort to get $10 billion out of us. The credit packages are immense. The work is intense. The diligence is quite complete. And in the end, we think the projects are, are better. We think that they're, they have a higher probability of success. So I don't think of us as overly political. I think of us as a, a real, real industrial policy and real world impact. To be blunt, we're an applicant driven organization. And if you look at the states where our applications are coming from, there does not appear to be a lot of politics in that. It just is what it is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we've got here, uh, you know, in our portfolio, companies like Ascend Elements, where their factories, you know, whilst it might be lithium ion recycling, going into states like Kentucky, which are uh, traditionally strongholds for uh, not lithium driven businesses, right? So yeah. I, I think we're actually seeing both sides of the aisle really get behind these sorts of projects, right? And, and, and 1706, the Energy Infrastructure Reinvestment Act, is, is very interesting, right? Like, where is, you know, a lot of the legacy, you know, oil and gas assets? Like, they need to do energy infrastructure reinvestment as well. And so, you know, we have a project, you know, is going to be, you know, heavily in Texas. 
that we're going to have a project which is going to be, you know, heavily in Louisiana. We're going to have a project naturally that's going to be, you know, in, uh, we have lots of projects in Montana, in, in, uh, in Nevada. And so as we, as you think about like where the infrastructure is, it's not surprising that there's going to be high overlap with some of the old oil and gas industry. Yeah. Let's, let's get out of that rabbit hole of, of politics and maybe go to, to some pragmatics around what are the actual types of deals that you do. Because I think a lot of the headlines that we see are these big multi-billion dollar gigafactory type things, which I know is a significant portion on a dollar's basis of what you're doing. But realistically, for every company out there building a gigafactory, there's probably a hundred American startups that don't ever need to build a gigafactory, maybe need like a 50 to $100 million recycling facility, making it up, right? So maybe give us the size and the shape of the sorts of deals that you're actually doing. Yeah, I mean, we don't have a minimum in our uh, guidance document, but I, I'm very comfortable telling people in Chatham House Rules uh, way that if you're less than 150-ish million, the embedded costs associated with our program start to become real. We lend money at treasuries plus between three-eighths of a point and 2%. We're definitely better than anything you're going to get in any private lender. We know that. The additional costs, though, are, like many private lenders, you pay our diligence costs. And our diligence costs can be between 2 and $4 million. And so on a $10 billion loan, you don't notice it. On a $100 million loan, you're like, well, hold on, that's like a lot of that's like a real component like that's you know that's interesting and if you're talking about a three or a four year loan all of a sudden that's a real cost the other cost is time we are not fast my favorite quote if any of you have heard me speak you'll probably have heard me say this before but Hofstetler's law and Hofstetler's law says that the project will take longer than you think to complete even when taking into account Hofstetler's law and that is very true at the Department of Energy. We're working on it. It's part of the reason that I'm in the role that I'm in. We got to get our time frames down, but right now it's about two years to get a loan out of us, and we got to get that down. Yeah, absolutely. Too long. Obviously, we should move for faster, but I think what you're, you're maybe um, underselling yourself on is many of these projects, really, you are trying to do first of a kind type things where actually the rest of the private market is inefficient on these things. That's actually a good point. You know, like this is the first active anode assembly facility. This is the first large scale battery pack assembly you know, facility. This is the first hydrogen storage long-term energy solution you know, project in, uh, uh, that's the ACES Delta project in Utah. So there's a number of these where in addition to funding the project and giving the project the debt leverage that they need to scale, we're also hoping to make it easier for you know, our friends in the private credit sector to lend the next deal. And we want them to do it two or three times such that our friends in the commercial banking sector does it later. And you see that success story in utility scale solar. The first iteration of LPO did a lot of utility scale solar back when utility scale solar was not as bankable as it is today. And so going forward, we're hoping that, you know, whether it's offshore wind or nuclear, let's talk about that in a second, or hydrogen, or sustainable aviation fuels, or critical materials, or whatever it is that we're doing first of a kind stuff, that five years, 10 years from now, JP Morgan's banking it. Yep, got it, absolutely. And maybe square this in my mind, because you said two things. One is, one of the explicit goals of the DOE LPO is to get these technologies to market faster but then you also said it takes two years to get money out of you. So yeah, just how do you square these two things together? Poorly. I encourage you to, to, to sit in on the meetings that we have with the undersecretary. He, you know, is a huge fan of our program, but is pushing us to, to figure out how to do this faster. The biggest risk in our portfolio right now is that we don't do the mandate that Congress gave us. The biggest risk that we have is that instead of deploying 350 billion, we deploy 70 billion. And we gotta realize that that's a real risk. It means that all of the entrepreneurs here, some of you don't get debt financing. All of the entrepreneurs that are at RA Plus don't get debt financing. And we don't scale these industries that we need to scale. Yep. Okay, I would like to, for everybody here, uh, you can get shots at the bar because we're about to do a climate, climate week uh, bingo. <laughs> 
Okay, we just heard about Local Law 97 earlier on. I'm sure every yep. person in every panel today has heard about Local Law 97. Just announced some changes in it where basically we're going to get effectively mulligans given to people who are, you know, doing best efforts um, in it. But whilst at the same time, certain other parts of it got more stringent. Any, any thoughts here on A, is Local Law 97 too stringent, not stringent enough? Is it pragmatic? Just uh, expand. Local Law 97 and any state and local law, I'm not gonna have a huge amount of comment on. Here's what I will say. We just released, speaking of buildings, last week at RA Plus, we released our Pathways to Commercial Liftoff report on virtual power plants. And from our perspective, the thing that we can help do is help figure out how to make debt financing cheaper for distributed energy resources. And as we, think about energy burdens in communities, as we think about underinvesting in energy infrastructure in buildings, and as we think about the ways that we can help, it seems relatively obvious that we should be partnering with here in New York, NYSERDA, in Connecticut, Connecticut Green Bank, and by the way, whatever it might be, iBank in California, Mass Housing, Rhode Island, whatever it is, pick your state. I picked some, some states that are topic of mine, but I also want to pick states, uh, state, state energy financing institutions in Texas and uh, Louisiana and Oklahoma and everywhere. Every, we want to do it all. And the thing that we want to do is figure out how to take the, you, tell, you guys tell me, the hundreds of billions of dollars annually that, are, that is put forth in CapEx in the building sector and optimize it. Every year that goes by that we don't have smarter heat pumps, smarter HVAC systems, EV charging systems that talk to the grid, commercial building refrigeration systems that they tout, oh, we, we, we buy electricity at night and we turn it into ice and that, and that powers our air conditioning unit. That's great, but electricity at night may or may not be clean. We need to have demand response, we need to have grid interconnected buildings where we are optimally using the energy generation that we have. And I can say this because it's public, PG&E has a $10 billion application in with us to do just that. Induce the correct equipment in buildings, residential and commercial induce the creation of software that will help network all of those uh, distributed energy resources together and engage in significant distributed generation, distributed storage, distributed discharge, load shedding, load shifting. And if we can do that at significant scale, we can fundamentally increase the amount of renewables on the distribute on the generation side of the grid from 40 percent to 60 and we need to do that because the utilization factor on renewables is not very high and if we want to be able to continually increase what we think is a relatively cheap generation asset we need to be able to increase that factor by a lot and the only way to do that we believe is vpp yeah, absolutely. And this is one, obviously, real estate focus uh, over here. Uh, massive inefficiency in the market. There's a reason why any city in America you fly into, there are no solar panels on all of the commercial buildings. In Europe, you fly into Germany, they've all got solar panels on there. And it's just this weird quagmire of misaligned incentives, right? Like each project is too small. You can't bundle them up and, you know, uh, build portfolios. The tenant is paying uh, for the electricity cost, but the building owner is paying the capex. It's P just a quagmire. PPA of income is not a qualified yes, REIT income. P exactly. PPA income is taxable for read how is that right? possible these are, these are absolutely things that we need to work on and we also need to solve the chicken and the egg problem so our first vpp deal which we announced a commitment for back in uh, april was for residential solar and people are like did you just help residential solar get a little bit marginally cheaper and our response is no we are getting involved in a working market to induce the software we want to induce the equipment that can talk to the software. And unless we're in there saying, you have to do it if you want our loan guarantee, they won't do it. And we would love to figure out how to do this in the commercial real estate sector. We would love to do smart heat pumps. 
um, because this is the thing that I really do fundamentally like. You know, people ask me like, "What's success if we, ha you know, you know, when 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 Jigger and I leave?" And success is if we can get VPPs to be broadly accepted as the thing where pie in the sky. Fanny and Freddie are like, "Oh, you're not doing VPPs." I don't know that we can do your loan or your loan is a higher rate or the commercial real estate sector. If you're not doing VPPs, then you know you can't you know, sign a, a lease with Amazon or Microsoft or whoever else. If we can do that and we can increase the percentages of renewable generation and if we can restart nuclear to get clean, firm, base load uh, on the other side, wow. I mean, we won't be able to hit our 2035 goals, but we can't hit our 2035 goals without those things. Yep, absolutely, 100% agree, and I think there's a bunch of people from the real estate industry here who are you know, quietly pounding the table uh, at the back there. Okay, final question here, and I like to leave on a very practical note. We've got a bunch of startup founders in the room. How and when should they engage with you? Well, I mean, you should engage with us all the time. We have an active business outreach and development team, asset sourcing team, whatever you want to call it. Um, and they want to talk. Like, you know, we, uh, we want to be involved in the building sector. 40% of emissions come from buildings. We have a robust team working on this. We are working with NYSERDA. We are working with Connecticut Green Bank. We are working with, you know, founders who have interesting ideas. And not all of the ideas are going to be ready for debt-financed expansion. We get it. Um, but we still want to talk to you. You know, we want to figure out how to, like, you know, how do we plug in? And, and invariably, you know, the opportunities are, you know, going to come faster than I think people realize. There we go. The $300 billion man. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Guys, thanks very much. It's great to chat with you.